Well, hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Rebel Love Podcast. Today, my guest is Greg Halama, a codependency coach that has developed his own mastermind model of group healing and uses internal family systems in his one-on-one coaching to help people grow through codependency and find their power. His philosophy on personal growth is that each of us already has the right combination of information inside us to achieve incredible growth. He's a believer that where we experience the greatest source of frustration in our lives is actually the exact place we need to focus most. Hi, Greg. How's it going? Hey, Talia. It's going well. Thanks so much for having me here. Thank you for being here. I'm really excited to talk about this today. Today, we're going to be talking about honoring our boundaries with the people you love. So before we get started, Greg, I'd love it if you could just share a little bit about yourself. And often when I interview guests on the Rebel Love podcast, I find that a lot of therapists and coaches go into their field of work because of something they've experienced in their own life. How has your journey impacted this path you've taken and how did it all begin for you? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, my origin stories, I, it, I, I had, I, it's interesting because I, I was blessed with a really good childhood in a lot of ways, but there were some parts of it that weren't as good as they could have been. Like my, my parents were amazing mother and father, but as two humans loving each other, man, um, husband and wife, they didn't give me the best example. And they often uh, got into a lot of arguments and just that was my model of seeing, seeing two people live together. And um, eventually I got into a relationship um, where it like, it it modeled a lot of those attributes. Uh, We were fighting all the time. I didn't, I didn't know what to do because I would trigger her abandonment. She would say something that would trigger my ego. I'd want, I'd feel this anger coming up in me and I'd want to run. But then she would say, if you leave, it's going to make it worse. So I would stay for some weird reason. And then I would blow up and get into this like rage because my boundaries were being crossed. And it was this, it was this kind of like spiral effect where if I ran, I lost. If I stayed, I lost. And I just felt trapped and I just kind of withered away into this nothingness depression Um, and but also at the same time I was realizing that like if I leave this relationship I'm just going to attract this in some other weird way so what happens if I stay and learn the lesson that I need to learn because there's always like this this image of pain this thing that we fear and it's, it really is an illusion in a lot of ways, even though it, even though we do have physical responses in our body, the moment we go through the lesson, it kind of just like vanishes in front of our eyes. And that, that is exactly what happened in this relationship. I, I learned the lesson on setting boundaries. Um, there was a very clear moment with my girl, with this person where she said something I didn't like. And normally I would get mad and yell at her, but I like was in my body and I just said, if you ever use those words again, like never use those words again. And I was grounded in it, in my masculinity. And from that moment, everything just, just flipped. We didn't end up staying together. Um, a lot of the reason was because I started setting boundaries and it didn't feel good for her. So she ended up leaving, but it was this moment of like, wow, like I've really learned the lesson. And then it just does like the pain dissolved before me. And that path just, it just set me on this path of realizing that there's so many other people in the world that experience these feelings that are seeing the pain in front of them. And, and, you know, we all have this kind of conflict avoider in us that runs away from the pain. It's like, no, how can we make people feel safe to actually go through the pain? Because it's really is an illusion. And once we help people through it, they look, they look back and like, Whoa, why, why didn't I do this earlier? Um, and yeah, it's just this incredible experience of helping other people through that same sort of environment that I've been through. Mm-hmm. Wow. It always reminds me of this book. I don't know if you read this book growing up. It's called Going on a Bear Hunt. And there's a part in the book that says, you can't go over it. You can't go under it. You can't go around it. You've got to go through it. <laughs> and like that book, I was like, oh my gosh, this book is such a metaphor for life. <laughs> You've really got to go through it and learn the lessons. Otherwise, you never, you, you, you keep making the same mistakes. 
Yeah. Well, it, it's very similar to emotions too, right? Like you can't go around anger. You can't go over uh, sadness. You, you have to feel the emotions and you have to be in your physical body and just feel it because it's when we feel it that we, we actually go through it and they mm-hmm. dissolve. Yes. Yes. And that's, that, yeah, that I've experienced that too. And obviously I, I guess like a lot of people I've had um, a lot of resistance to that, but when you do, and it actually does dissolve, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing actually. I mean, I, I'm no, I'm not a Buddhist or any, I don't know much about it, but I, I would imagine maybe that's the role of meditation is to kind of like be in it and experience the now. And, you know, yeah, yeah. So that, that is, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is like, so there's, there's this part of people where I I feel like a a lot of people have this, the conflict avoider, right? You, you feel someone is um, fighting you or punishing you. uh, And we have this physical response in our body where we we go, Oh, wow. Like maybe, maybe we feel anxious in our chest or our body starts to tighten up. We might even feel it in our legs. And it's like this massive constriction And that constriction kicks us out of our head. So we don't even, we don't even, we're not able to respond anymore. We might even detach and not be able to think, but it's, but the, the way that I actually healed that in myself was through meditation. I remember a moment where, um, someone like one of my friends, we were next to a cliff and he was like, Hey, you want to sit on this cliff with me? And I was like, no, you're crazy. Like, but I was like, no, you're crazy. Like, no, I don't want to, like, I was terrified of this cliff and I could feel those same sort of emotions in my body, but he, he encouraged me to do it and we did it. And I I felt myself meditating on this cliff and I had the fear response come through me, but I also had the awareness that, um, our, that emotions it's like if we feel the physical sensation in our body and if you try to label the emotion just purely by the physical sensation, you can't. Like, what is fear? My legs are shaking. My chest is tight. Like, what is the emotion of fear? So in this moment, I was, I was on this cliff trying to find what the actual sensation felt like. And then after doing that and like feeling it, like really feeling it and not trying to run from the cliff, not trying to think of something else, the the energy just passed through me and then I, I was able to sit calmly on this cliff and then the next time I went back to the cliff like a week later all the fear of going up to the edge was just gone it was like completely gone and this is this is also a beautiful experience because now in the scenarios where it would be a boss who is just like grilling me that, that fear response was much less. And then I can practice it in that environment. Like, okay, what's actually coming up in my body right now. Mm-hmm. And I, I do not like a cliff is an extreme example, but like find, find the equivalent of like, what is something that is, is like a three on a scale um, a, like a three to a five on a scale of 10, find that moment and sit in that experience and feel these feelings coming up because that is, exactly it it's about meditating it's about allowing these feelings to come up so that they can pass through us eventually mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's really interesting you say that actually because i did vipassana um like a fair few years ago now and if if you don't know if you're listening and you don't know what vipassana is it's basically 10 days of meditation where you meditate 10 and a half hours a day and you don't talk to anyone and all the women and men are separated and you meditate in a hall together and you don't talk to anyone and you hardly eat anything and it was an amazing experience but i remember before i did it somebody i mean i really didn't want to find out too much about it before i did it because i didn't want to talk myself out of it and so I'd booked it in and someone said to me, oh, I said, oh, like a day before <laughs> I said, oh, I'm doing Vipassana. And she goes, oh, that'll be so great. And I was like, oh, you've done it. And she's like, yeah. And I said, oh, what was your experience? And she goes, oh, the pain. And I was like, hang on, what? <laughs> I was like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and she goes, the physical pain. And I was like, physical pain? <laughs> I was like, I hadn't even thought about that. Like it did not cross my mind that sitting down in the same position for 10 and a half hours a day and once you get to the, the main type of meditation, they encourage you not to move for the, you know, for the hour that you do that particular type of meditation. And I remember just having this kind of <laughs> feeling going, wow, like I just 
I never thought that the feeling like you were just describing of sitting in that pain would be, would teach me so much. And yeah. anyway, I went ahead and I did it. And it was such an incredible experience for that time in my life. It really shifted something for me and gave me an experience and way of learning that I'm so grateful for. So, but I was just, it really reminded me when you were sitting on that cliff, you know, thinking about how to really describe it. I think that's really, really, a really interesting and useful observation. Yeah. Did you notice anywhere in particular that your body felt the pain? Like the knees are always the possible. like the knees are going to feel like they're going to blow up at some point, but did you find it anywhere else too? Uh, well, in the lower back, I had lower back issues and you're not allowed to get support unless you've got a medical, like you've, you know, and it hadn't, um, I've got a very sway back. So I did have lower back issues, but I couldn't, I didn't go to them because I was like, the doctor hadn't diagnosed me, but I kind of maneuvered, I kind of was a bit cheeky and maneuvered <laughs> the blanket in a specific way that it supported my back. But um, I actually don't remember it feeling that. I had a really amazing experience. Like it was really incredible. And the, their very first actual sit that I had, the hour sit on the fourth day, I did not move a muscle. I remember them saying, okay, choose a spot. And I made a point to literally not move a muscle for an hour. And it was the most incredible experience. It was the highest high I'd ever had without any other substance. <laughs> and it was just, yeah. it was so amazing. And I remember once we went out someone was bawling their eyes out and all these people were having all these different emotions. And I was like, you know, yeah. five levels higher. It was just incredible. Well, um, I think this is a, a good point for the, the people listening. If, if you're not familiar with the pasana, the, the teaching is to sit in discomfort for an hour and not move mm -hmm. and just to experience that discomfort. And there's, there's different techniques that they're actually teaching you, but the, the main philosophy is we're not labeling pain as bad and we're not labeling the ecstasy as good. Even though when we experience the ecstasy of the Boston, we still kind of do, but yeah. it's like, oh, okay, what happens when we do have this pinch? Like, it's just a pinch. Why are we saying it's bad? It's mm -hmm. the same as like going out in the rain. Like people will refer to the rain as bad, but like mm -hmm. going out in the rain with a rain jacket or an umbrella is incredible. Like I used yeah. to see that all the time in Sydney, listening yeah. to music and going the rain. Like why are we labeling these things? Like why are we really labeling these things as bad? Mm -hmm. Same with sadness too. Like a lot of people have a tendency to label sadness, anger as bad. But like these are all emotional states. And if we're, if we're labeling as bad, we're going to suppress them. And the thing about emotions is they all have a message to tell us. Anger is like, you're not setting boundaries. Sadness is we're, we're, we're sad. We're depressed. <clears throat> we're not on our path. Like something's off. Like let's reorient. But we suppress mm. them. So they get, they, they have a message and they get angry with us because we're not listening. So uh, anger turns to rage because it's like, no, we really have a boundary here. Mm -hmm. So do something about it. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing in this, in, you know, our, our culture today is we, we don't, we label an emotion bad and we don't allow ourselves to feel it. Mm. And that's what Vipassana taught me is be the observer. Like you said, like it's there, it's happening, be the observer and then, you know, and feel it. And uh, anyway, I feel like, I feel like there's so much we could talk about here. I love this, but um, I want to get back to boundaries in our own lives. Um, so you just touched on it then about like anger coming and not setting boundaries. How important is it to learn to set boundaries in our relationships and what's the impact of not setting boundaries? Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I really feel like the, the skill of learning to set boundaries. I, I feel like it is the, the most foundational skill we could ever learn as a human and really if we just focused on that how it would change our entire life um like if you think about the person that you want to become and just like the radiant self the person the fullest expression or if you like look at another person you go oh that person you know like look at how happy they are you can't really find that for yourself like becoming that version of a human requires you to protect your energy it's, it requires you to know what you like what you don't like and if you don't like it to be able to, to voice that and not feel the guilt not feel all the negative stuff that we've we've been conditioned to feel um, through no fault of our own 
and really stand in your power and be like, this is my life. Like, I'm super excited about this. And the, the risk is when we don't have those boundaries in place for us, we're constantly compromising uh, ourself for others. We're putting others' needs before our own. And slowly it's like, it's like we just lose ourselves, really. We, we don't, we're not in our fullest expression. We don't end up being happy. And we constantly question why, why we're like this. It's interesting that you say that like that. I remember um, having the experience of breaking up with someone and and kind of saying in, in to myself, like, I love you, but I love me more. And, you know, it sucks. And it's, uh, it, you know, it, it sounds really bad, I guess, when you say it out loud, but but it's true. You know, this is my boundary and this is what I need to move forward. And obviously there was like a string of events that happened before that and stuff, but, but it was just, it's just interesting hearing that. So, you know, what about if, if we don't, you know, we don't know what we don't know, um, what might be some clues if we're unknowingly not setting strong boundaries in our private lives, what, like, uh, what clues might manifest to let us know that perhaps we're lacking in that area? Yeah trying to think of the clues it's i think it's 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 like oh well, a, a big clue is resentment is like frustration if you feel like you look at a person and you go oh or maybe it's maybe it's in a relationship where you want something and they're not giving it to you and every time that kind of question arises there's like this frustration that's boiling up in you that's a big clue um and the the real like root of this is like we don't we don't want to get to that point where the resentment is building up we want to be able to when someone asks us like what do we want to do we want to be able to feel in our bodies and and like really understand what it is that we want to do because if we're if we're you know if someone is crossing our boundary and we don't say anything and we cross it again it's like this frustration will slowly build and that's where that's where the resentment is coming from because our our energetic body our emotional body has felt it the first time but we kind of ignored our intuition and then it happened again happened again and the, it just slowly builds over time and this is the dangerous part is because that more that resentment builds it's kind of like it's kind of like what tectonic plates for an earthquake where it's like slowly building this pressure over time and then all of a sudden it just it just slides and that's when we slip into that's when we like release this anger maybe it's even rage because it's built up and people often feel like there's a monster inside of them because they they like go into this state and they're like whoa i'm a i'm like a calm person what happened mm. but that is that's our emotional system. It's like our emotional navigation system. That's what intuition is. It's, it's defending us and saying, no, 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 you have a boundary here. We're going to make sure that you set this boundary, whether you not, what, like you have no choice now. You have no choice now. The resentment has built up for this long. We're going to take over. And you'll get that clue along the line is there's this slight resentment and listen to that and do something about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so... Here is a common scenario that I'm really interested in finding out your opinion on. Um, I've noticed that when you are typically kind of lax with your boundaries, just as you were describing, people get really used to that really quickly and they get really comfortable. They get really comfortable doing what they want to do. And then once people decide to set boundaries, perhaps it's right before that um, burst of anger, before the the plate slip, um, uh, they can get a really strong pushback. Um, because people aren't used to being, you know, uh, but aren't used to those boundaries coming up. So what are some useful ways we might be able to express our boundaries in that particular scenario? Um, well, I think there's, I think the, the bigger thing that's going on is that we're, we're not in that scenario. I would, I would imagine <clears throat> the person is not consistently setting boundaries so that's that's the issue is when we're lax with our boundaries um people need that reminder like imagine we were setting but you were setting a boundary on me you say 
um, like, Greg, I don't, I don't like it when you, when you say this thing and <clears throat> I don't know where your boundaries are. So I'm probably going to forget and then accidentally say it again. And if you don't reinforce that boundary in that moment, I'll, I'll have the impression that, Oh, like I don't even realize there's a boundary. So I'll say it again, accidentally. And this, this is the moment where it becomes important for the person who is becoming lax with the boundaries where they just have, we, we just have to realize that we all have, this is something I work on as well is boundaries require consistent communication. And when there's enough communication built up over time, people will have it imprinted in them. They'll just remember, they'll be like, Oh, I, I, I know, I know there's a boundary here. I've like hit my head against it 10 times already now. Mm -hmm. And it just becomes established. It might require a little bit of work after that point, but that's, that's really the underlying issue is when we become lax with our boundaries, people don't see them because they, it's not their responsibility to know our boundaries. It's our responsibility to communicate our boundaries. Right. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I remember this um, situation where there's this one person who has a very, had a very strong personality and I, I t tend to s set pretty strong boundaries um, with with certain people, with most people, I think. And there was two of us, and we were both, and it was in a workplace environment. And the person who had the very strong personality was pushing uh, my friend's boundaries because she didn't have clear boundaries, and she was very accommodating. And so this person would push her around a lot, and she never treated me like that. And my friend said to me, "How come she never, she just never treats you like that?" And it's like because there's just no way I'd let it get away with it. Like as soon as she did something, I would say something. And she did. She did push my boundaries once. She was incredibly rude to me. And I called her out straight away. And she was really taken aback. And I think she knew I was going to, um, but it never happened again after that. And it, my friend was like, oh, my gosh, I've never seen that before. <laughs> and, I was, and, and then she started getting stronger in her boundaries. And the behavior started to change. It was really interesting. You know, and she's, she's so polite. She would just say, hey, that's really not going to work for me. That's really not going to work for me. I can't do that. Yeah, I'm not available, things like that. And it, it was really lovely to see this kind of growth in the boundary setting area, like right in front of my eyes. I was just like, oh, this is, this is really fascinating. <laughs> How did it feel for you that first time where you saw a rise and you, you set a boundary how did that feel what was the emotion that you experienced well you know it was really funny um because I was kind of thinking about it when my friend brought it to my attention I was like it's funny because we've never actually had a conflict I, I think that I've just got a, a quite strong personality as well I think she just knew that if something happened that I wouldn't be shy I'm not a conflict avoider so if if if, if conflict is necessary then I don't I just don't shy away from it I just never have and mm. I mean but I don't I don't seek it out but she, you know, and I think that she just knew that about me. So she never tried to push me. But this one particular time she was going through something and she was, and it was actually quite mean. She was just making fun of me unnecessarily and she was trying to have a dig at me. And, um, you know, I got that surge of, okay, here we go. <laughs> here yeah. it is. That was what it was. Yeah, that surge of, oh, because it was in a public space as well. And I just totally called her out and, I, and, and I'm much more kind of blunt about it than she is. And I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't raise my voice. I didn't swear. I have a kind of, I try to have a rule where if I'm angry, I don't swear because it comes off as so much more um, yeah. aggressive. Um, but I do swear normally. So also as well, you know, which is quite interesting that I try not to swear in conflict because of that reason. But um yeah, she, it, it was a huge surge, I remember thinking. And then as soon as it happened and I said it, she just was like, okay, and really, you know, it was taken aback and shut down because I was like, yeah, that's not okay. You know, you, you don't get to speak to me like that. I'm, I'm not okay with that. It's and a beautiful she, moment, right, when that, when that feeling arises. For me, I, I always feel like it's like a cue. I'm like, oh, time for, a it's like time for action. Because a lot of people, they look at anger, you know, as bad, but it's like, it's like that protection mechanism. It feels like a protector coming out to like assert itself and, and, and like, just take a stand. Yeah. I, I find it nice now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, 
it was kind of, it was really interesting because I was wondering when it was going to happen because this particular person would, would push a lot of people's boundaries. She kind of, it was almost like she'd do it just to see what kind of reaction she would get, but she never did it with me until that, that day. And then she's never done it since. <laughs> so it was really interesting to, to see that experience. And um, yeah, and I think also as well, like uh, I've had to work on it over the years is saying things with love. Like I certainly had to learn that. I definitely, I've always been on the side of kind of too blunt, which is not helpful. <laughs> um, so I've had to learn, you know, that tact over the years and it's been a really slow process to be honest. And now I think I'm finally getting it but for our listeners if they are struggling with that like I did how you know what are some ways that we what are some language that we can use to set boundaries with love you know so I think that becomes a bit of an issue sometimes people thinking we're doing it to really I don't know um kind of stir the pot a bit um rather than actually say you know what I'm just asserting what's okay for me and not okay for me yeah I I think the 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 first time that we set a boundary on someone if if we're like listening to that anger like if we're feeling something in our chest we're feeling the frustration boil up and we're we go okay it's time to set a boundary in that moment it's usually easier to do it and like we can kind of put that feeling of anger in the back seat and say hey like i got this i'm going to say it in a nice way and um the first couple of times where we say it it's easier to just say it nicely like we're calm we're saying hey like I don't like it when you say this but the issue becomes when you know everyone has a really difficult person in their life that doesn't respect the boundaries even though we're saying it nicely and this is the moment where it's like okay now what do we do my boundary's been crossed this is the moment where I actually like to channel that anger but like you said I don't curse I don't drop into like an accusational voice, I'll just say like, I've told you four times now what my boundary is. I'm getting to the point where I'm getting really frustrated. And if you cross it one more time, I'm going to have to leave. And it's just like, we have to be very firm in that moment. And even saying it like that can trigger someone's emotional, we're basically we're triggering someone else's trauma. And then it becomes the question, is there, is their trauma my responsibility? Is their emotional immaturity to be able to handle my boundary, my responsibility? And the answer is not so simple, but it's most likely no. It just depends on how, 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 you know, important this person is your life. Is it someone that you really care about? Is it, and also, is it, is it a partner? Uh, and if it's a partner, if it's a really good friend, if it's um, a family member, the way I like to handle this situation, and maybe with others I don't know too, is just say, hey, like, um, this th- this has nothing to do with me not loving you. If anything, this, I love you. I love you so much. Mm-hmm. Because what happens is when, like, have you, like, this feeling, if you just think about when someone sets a boundary on you, do you feel like they love you? Yeah, of course. I feel, yeah. I mean, I, it depends who it really, it depends who it's coming from. Like if I know they love me and they're telling me something and it's a little bit hurtful, then I go to me, that's a clue. It's like, okay, yeah. if it hurts a little bit, that means for me anyway, I can't speak for anybody else that part of what they're saying is resonating as truth for me. And then I'm like, Oh, hang on. That's not who I want to be. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that moment is interesting because for a lot of people, we, we assume that person doesn't like us. Mm. Um, and we feel that we feel like, Oh, it, it, to a lot of people, it feels like the opposite of love. Mm. So when you set a boundary on someone, they can feel, they can feel like we don't love them. And in that moment, it just really helps to just, to just say, no, like this, I know, I know this might not feel good for you. Um, but I, I, I love, I do love you. And I love, I love myself as well. And this is really important for me to take time and space for myself. But I just want you to know that I, I, even though I'm setting this boundary, I still love you. And like I said, if you cross my boundary, I'm going to walk away. So I'm just going to remove myself from this conversation now. Like that happened to me once where me setting my boundary firmly, it caused another person to cry. It was a really good friend of mine. 
And I had to think like, oh, okay, do I just leave or do I spend 30 extra seconds to, to, to just explain that this doesn't have anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. But that was actually a really powerful moment for that person because mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, it's like sometimes people might vent to us and they, they want to get something off their chest but I allowed them to feel what was coming up for them. And then they had this whole process that they went through where it actually was a gift for them to experience mm -hmm. the, the pain that was coming up and to really sit with it. And mm -hmm. if we're not setting our boundaries, we actually are helping people to avoid their own pain and we're helping people to avoid their own growth. Mm -hmm. I, I think what happens, um, I don't know. Sometimes when you know you've like, let's say you've violated a boundary and, and I'm going to assume here that most people don't do it on purpose. Um, but when someone does call you out, there's definitely this kind of like feeling of like shame or something like you've done something wrong. Like you're a little kid, you know, and you're like, when you know you've done something wrong and it's like this bubble em envelops you and you're like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, like I'm in trouble. I don't know. Have you, have you ever had that feeling? And I experience that all the time yeah I was like oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and then you're like yeah and then you're like oh my gosh you know because it because it takes a minute to kind of go hang on I'm an adult now you know I'm not a child because the because I think what's interesting about that that moment if the knee-jerk reaction is to kind of go as a kid what do you do you go I didn't do it I didn't do it mm. you know it wasn't me when it's like hang on was it though? Was it you as an adult? You're like, hang on, I'm not there anymore. I don't need to react like that. W what is going on? Is this true? And then you go, okay. And it, cause I think that's where I think apologizing is so healing. Cause it's like saying, Hey, I, you know, I did something wrong. And I think the lamb, I really like the landmark philosophy of apologizing. Cause it's like, okay, like the getting complete. If you're going to say sorry for something, it's no use just saying it. It's, sorry is a behavior. So you say, sorry, you get complete. But then you don't do it again. You say, okay, from this day on, I'm saying that I'm not going to do that again. That's the sorry in my behavior, not just mm. me saying the words. Because words, yeah. you know, anybody can say words. Well, I, th I think that's the important part about having um, uh, an argument with some with your partner or a loved one is like in, in relationship, I know as a, a man, when my partner would start to say something about me I'd be like, like I that would trigger me and then I would just ignore it but now it's like okay like I need to ground myself hear what this person is actually saying and be able to receive it without getting upset and then like is what they're saying actually true yes and if it's true then I need to take responsibility and if I can't in that moment, if maybe it might be hard. So I, I just say like, I hear what you're saying. I, I just, I'm not sure I need to look at this, mm. but then if it's not true, you know, then we need to, we need to do something about it because sometimes people project their things onto us. And, mm -hmm. and that, that, that moment of taking responsibility and being in that grounded state is, is really important. Mm. Well, I always think when, you know, I always like when I've gone to therapy and the therapist have sometimes I've had therapists who say things to me, reflect things back. And then, and I'm like, hang on, that's not right. But then I think, well, hang on. The therapist only knows what you've told them. So how did they yeah. get that impression? If you didn't tell, if you didn't tell them that. And so I'm kind of like, okay, hang on. Did I tell it in a way that, that projected that or are they hearing it? in a different way. And that's what I kind of think, you know, in the scenario you just said of like, if it's not true, you know, what am I doing that could be contributing to this reality for them? Or like you said, is it them projecting? And I think that, you know, being able to really look at things and take a step back. And sometimes in that moment, it's, it's like, hang on, I just need a minute. <laughs> I just need a minute to, you know, process this and, you know, sit in the feelings for a bit to really see what the truth is rather than, you know, knee jerk reactions again. Yeah, exactly. Knee jerk reactions are where we get into trouble. Sure. Mm -hmm. that's, and that's the trigger. But when we're triggered, we have that beautiful opportunity to, to later sit in it and think, why, why did I actually have this response? And where is it coming from? And often things come up afterwards when we're actually sitting in that meditative space with it. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, just really, uh, really, it's really, this is the conversation such a reminder to me to how important meditation is. I have, I definitely have a, um, an in and out of my life relationship with <laughs> meditation. So, <laughs> um, so with romantic relationships versus uh, friendships, is it harder for one or the other to set boundaries? And, and if so, why is that? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's so much harder in romantic relationships because it feels like for some reason, it just feels like there's more at risk, um, with, with friends, it's still hard, but eventually it gets to the place where you you can set a boundary on them. And you kind of can like, if, if your friends are also of the sort that are emotionally aware, you can kind of just give them like a couple of days to sit in that feeling that came up. If you accidentally set a boundary that brought something up in them and then you'll come back and they'll, it like, they'll have gone through their own process. But with, um, with a partner, it's so much harder because you're, you're there with them. You live, you, maybe you live with them or you just, you know, you see each other all the time. And there's this, <clears throat> there's this sense of if I do this, and they don't like it, I might lose them. But the, the reality, which is much harder to embody, I even, it's still, it's like something that I have to be very conscious of is um, if, oh, what's, there's, a, there's a really amazing quote that my friend shared with me once, and it is, in order to get the relationship you want, you have to risk the relationship that you have. Mm. and that's not to say that we take a risk and we're just going to lose the relationship to get another one but it's like okay i don't i don't like it when this person does this and i'm worried if i say something they're going to get upset but you you can rock the boat and then they're going to they're going to experience something in them and they have a decision to themselves grow and change or to stay stuck where they currently are. And if they stay stuck where they currently are, that's not the relationship that you want. And that's when you might move on. But the, the, the thing that happens most of the time, 95% of the time, we, we do what we want. It triggers the other person. We've learned techniques to actually communicate to them so that they're not as affected and we can also take our space but then they go through their own process and something in them shifts. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you took a risk, you lean toward the relationship that you wanted. Um, maybe there's a sense of freedom that you want and taking your own time every week, but you know that your partner's not gonna like it because they, they have something in them that's maybe triggered by abandonment. Um, but you, you took a risk and then you helped your partner through their stuff as well. So at the end of it, you guys are both benefiting. But if you don't take that risk again, it's like, okay, we're, we're both kind of just staying stuck at the level that we're at. So, you know, it's not fair to either of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, what, the quote you said just reminded me of another quote that has always really helped me is, uh, man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. Yeah. I remember that I was like, I always wanted to travel and I was like, but, but what if I miss what's happening here? It's the same thing with relationships, right? It's like, I mean, I think the one thing that's always constant, and this is another quote, I'm not sure who said this to me, um, is like the only thing that's constant is change. The only thing that's for sure is that everything changes, <laughs> which is kind of, you know, hard to handle when you kind of say it like that, but mm hmm yeah, change, change can be scary for a lot of people. Mm. It's like it's of, we like the comfort of what we've, what we've always known, and, you know? Yeah, totally. Like really, you know, have that environment set up and not stray too much away from it. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we do if we're caught in a situation with a family member who, like you said before, <laughs> there's always that one person who's just not respecting your boundaries. So what if it's like, an extended family member that's just really pushing the boundaries all the time. What are some ways you can handle that without blowing up? <laughs> um, and this is, 
I'm trying to think of how this is different from that, that other question. So can you give an example of what this, what this person might be doing? Hmm. I don't know. I guess like um, perhaps like I, th- I think a lot of people, a lot of family members kind of tease um, and perhaps it's like, you know what, it's kind of exhausting when you're around someone who's kind of poking fun and teasing all the time and you just want to kind of have regular conversations and perhaps you've like mentioned it like, hey, can you ease up a bit on the on the, on the the teasing? Um, and, you know, like they're like, oh, it's all in good fun, but it, like it literally is exhausting when someone's just constantly doing this and not respecting your boundaries and saying, Hey, it's really not, this is just really not working for me, this behavior. And the fact that it's constant, it's just constantly happening every time I see you. And I guess my response to that, um, cause it has happened to me before is almost like, I just don't want to be around you. Like I just don't really enjoy your company and, you know, I don't know how to express to you that if you want to see me, then you just can't keep doing that. Cause I, it's not funny. And it's not fun and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it really comes down to have you told this person clearly and what are you willing to, what are you willing to accept in your life? Mm. I, I have had moments where I just was really honest with someone and just was like brutally honest with them and told them exactly how I felt. Like, I don't feel like I can be friends with them if they're, if they're doing this. If it gets to that point and then we just see what happens or you just avoid them. You just don't put yourself in that scenario because at the end of the day, you know, we want to be with people that actually light us up. Mm -hmm. I I had a practice last year where I was just following connection. Like if I felt good and I felt like alive and I felt like the conversation was flowing, it was like this kind of breadcrumb path where I would just kind of like pick it up and go to the next person. If it wasn't feeling good, I would just, leave because sometimes there's also friends that we have where like it's on fire and it's feeling really fun and then another time it doesn't feel fun so we don't have to force it we can just find another conversation that feels fun as well and just keep like following that path of connection we're like where do things feel alive okay like let's let's go down that path and let's have some fun Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it's really interesting i read some um a thing on instagram the other day and a woman was talking about uh, she did a post about her four-year-old daughter and her grandfather, her, her father, her husband's dad, I think. Oh no, sorry. It was her mother's, um, her stepfather was playing with the daughter and the daughter wasn't enjoying it. And, and she said to her daughter, Hey, you can tell him no, if you want to tell him no. And she's like, mom, I can't. She's like four years old. She's like, can you tell him? I don't want to want to keep playing. And so she told him, and of course he was like, um, oh, well, you know, we're only playing. And she's like, no, she just, she's not enjoying it. Don't, don't keep doing it. And then he got really offended and, and she's just like, and she had to really stand up for her daughter and say, no, like, it's really not okay. She's not enjoying it. I've asked you not to do it. It's not, it's not cool. Just stop. And, and what was really interesting about reading that for me is that like, you know, I mean, this, these kinds of things happen all the time. And, and she was really willing to kind of go that extra mile and be uncomfortable for her daughter. But are we willing to be uncomfortable and go that extra mile for ourselves as well when those things happen? Because they do happen yeah. a lot, you know. It just really struck me reading that post. And that's, that's a beautiful moment for that child too because that's literally a moment that could be imprinted in them. What happens when someone crosses the boundary? We're not strong enough to do it ourselves and then like the parental figure which is actually like a representation of our own masculine energy or feminine energy then they back down well that's going to follow us the rest of our life but it's beautiful in that moment where she asserted it because then that that child is in such a better position position. yeah and the way she said it the way she wrote it anyway it wasn't offensive but it was just very strong hey and I think a lot of it as well as with tone, right? Hey, it's really not okay. And it's like when you speak to kids, you know, when you put on the parenting voice, because sometimes it's like, and my friend tells me like she's she's playing with her kids. And we used to do this in behavioral therapy with kids as well. And we were very serious. They'd actually tell us to lower our voices and speak in a certain manner. And it's, you know, and humans respond to that. They really respond to tone. That's why so many things can get misconstrued over text because there's no tone. And yeah. Yeah, I just thought, well, this, I think all this stuff is so fascinating. 
Um, but before like we go, if, sorry, speak go ahead. With a, with a deeper voice? Yeah, like speak a with a, a lower voice, yeah. A lower voice. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not sure what the psychology around this is, but I feel like for me anyway, hearing a man's voice when I was a child was much more intimidating than hearing a female voice because typically, not always, but typically the male voices were a lot lower. Mm. So if my dad got angry, it was much more serious than if my mum got angry. But I also knew when my mum was really angry. <laughs> I mean, she'd exercise her tone, you know, in a way that would communicate that to me. <laughs> But, uh, but that was just a really interesting observation, I thought. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, in a previous conversation we had, you mentioned the importance of breaking the automated response of doing something and creating a pause. Can you, I remember that just being a really interesting point. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that, that, this, is, um, this is probably the, the most important part about learning how to set boundaries. And it is... Really what it is, is when someone asks us something, we, we have this part of us that just replies instantly for some reason. And why that's happening is, is it's because we have these, we have, we have an ability to pick up on another person's emotions. It's, I mean, there's, there's like telepathy and intuition, but really it's like a system and we can, you know, dogs have, Dogs have empathic ability in that they, they can communicate without words because they're feeling each other. They're looking at facial expressions and they have this energetic sense. And there's the same thing is happening with humans where someone asks us to do something and it's almost like we're picking up on their energy, but people haven't realized that there is, um, that they have their own energy and we're just like feeling another person's desire and confusing it with our own. And we just automatically lean into that. And the, the, the key with setting boundaries is to recognize that we actually have a boundary around our own emotions and our own energy, and that another person has the same with theirs, and to just, just pause, right? If someone asks you a question, just to simply pause and to feel, just scan your body, just scan your intuition, and just to stop and think, like, what, what do I actually want to do? and then respond to them because if we're not doing that then we're we're just feeling what the other person wants and we're saying yes because we feel that, that we feel there's a yes on their part they want us to do something and we're just we're giving in uh at at first it might even be it's it's better even just to say hey you know i, I want to think about this first like because we need to create that space and even ex more extended period of time and, and get away from this person, get away from, you know, the, the decision that they're asking us because we're too close. There's too much proximity. We still feel it. We're not fully separated. And then over time, the process just becomes more intuitive. It's just going into our body, feeling what we actually feel and then honoring that. Mm -hmm. And uh, practice, if you want to practice that, just sit in silence. I love that we keep coming back to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it feels awkward. Silence feels awkward in conversation, but it's the same. It's the same feeling of setting a boundary. It's being okay in that awkwardness, being okay in that discomfort, and you can just practice it with a friend. Just, just like extend the silence, and you could even play with it. Just go silent until they say, they say something. And that's, that's a way of like building this muscle to break that automatic response. Because if you don't, you just, we're just going to say yes all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so before we begin to wrap up, um, I just wanted to see if you could give us some language that we could use. Um, like I know, for example, one thing that somebody taught me that really helped was that's not going to work for me. Um, saying that's not going to work for me doesn't blame anybody. It just puts it on you and goes, hey, this is kind of my boundary in a way that is very clear, um, but the language is kind of non-threatening. Do you have any other useful examples that you might be able to offer us? It's, well, it's tricky because one of the places that we want to get to eventually is just saying no and not not feeling we have to explain ourselves for it like we could we could say with a partner 
I don't like it when you do this. It makes me feel this way. And my need is this. So they have, at least if it's a partner, they have an explanation. Um, but it's just about knowing, you know, when is it your responsibility to explain yourself with a person that you love and you care about and you see all the time and it's something more complicated then yeah, it's very important to use a model like that. But if it's someone, if it's just a very silly thing, you know, a lot of times it's better just to say, no, I actually, yeah, exactly the words that you use and just end it there. Mm, we don't that's... need to explain ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just one last question, if you're finding implementing boundaries, a challenging practice, what's the smallest step we can start from? Like if people listening are just like, oh my gosh, like even the thought of, of setting a boundary because I haven't set boundaries for so long with anyone is just so daunting. Yeah. Where do I even start? Yeah. The awkward silence is a really helpful one. I like to suggest to people to find uh, a friend or a group of five friends that you're around each other much more frequently. And just to do a boundary setting practice where you guys say, Hey, over this next week, um, I'm going to be practicing boundaries. I would love it if you did it with me. And we're just going to, we're just going to, to build a space between the two of us, three of us, four of us, where it's okay to set boundaries. We know that it's a judgment free and and we're, we're probably not going to do it as gracefully as we could at the beginning, but that's okay. We're just going to lean into the space and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So I would start with that awkward silence and then build up to a space where you're, you're getting, getting consent beforehand always helps because you like the person is like, yeah, that, like that, that sounds exciting. Let's do that. Let's work on our boundaries together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something like that, some form of recipe like that, I would, I would highly recommend. Mm, I think that's a really great suggestion. I think that it's really, really true too. Or like, yeah, getting consent and doing it together. I love that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg, for being here. It has been such a pleasure speaking to you. I feel this, this lovely calm over me <laughs> when I speak to you. It's so nice. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing is um, uh, all, all, for the next basically month, I'm doing free masterminds on setting boundaries uh, without guilt, without feeling selfish. Uh, go to setlovingboundaries.com and see if these masterminds resonate with you. It's a group space where we're actually going to go into our own subconscious root of why do we feel guilt and, and literally clear that energetic block together with people. Super powerful. And then the other way is email me. I respond to every email. If you have a question on setting boundaries or you have a specific example that you want some feedback on, shoot me an email, greg, G-R-E-G -E at setlovingboundaries.com. And I literally respond to every email I get. I'd love, I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Thank Greg. You. And you can find all the links mentioned in this episode at rebellove.com forward slash EP30. Thank you, Greg. Legend, really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Rebel Love Podcast, the podcast about love, sex, relationships, and money. If you like this episode, please support us by subscribing and leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. And find all the details of this episode and more at rebellove.com forward slash podcast. 